Yeah, so now we really are going to hear from this person. So it's Bertrand Picard, who is a scientist, an explorer, um, a pilot of the Solar Impulse uh, Project. Um, the first person to uh, navigate the globe non-stop in an, in an air balloon. A man who certainly knows a thing or two about navigating the cloud space. Please welcome uh, Bertrand Picard. Good morning. I don't know what you had in mind when you saw in the program that it was a balloonist who was going to make the speech before lunch. What is the link between ballooning and your business? Well, it's quite clear that you are not here to prepare your own balloon flight around the world. So I'm going to be very short in the description of that adventure. What can I tell you? I can tell you that sometimes we had really easy wins in the good direction and everything was easy. But sometimes we have no wind, or almost no wind. And sometimes we have too much wind, turbulence, thunderstorms, and we're afraid for our life. If you know that, you know the entire story. So I can now come to a conclusion. I don't know if you knew it would be so short, but you know there's an advantage with short speeches, we have enough time for Q&A. And probably the first question in the Q&A would be something like that. Hey, wait a minute. That's not only ballooning. That's everything in life. We always have in our private life or professional life these moments where the trend is positive, where we are successful without any problems. But we also have these moments of problems and doubts, and we don't know how to find solutions. And sometimes, of course, we also have these big moments of crisis that can destroy everything we built. So if you have this question, I would fully agree. Because I deeply believe that a flight in a balloon is very similar to a journey through life. How to navigate in the atmosphere. Because life itself is like the atmosphere. There are a lot of winds everywhere. The winds of life. Trends, fashions, expectation of customers, stock exchange market, financial crisis, globalization, political decisions, new technologies. On a more personal level, things like health, accidents, sicknesses, failures, success, love, everything is just like the wind. It takes us by surprise and pushes us toward the unknown. And here starts the problem. And here also starts my speech, by the way. <laughs> Have you noticed how much energy and effort we put on fighting against the unknown? We speak of pioneering spirit and innovation, of course, and we make big seminars about it. But when we have changes occurring in our life, the first reaction is to fight against them. We want to stay in control. We want to avoid the doubts, to avoid the question marks, to fight against the unknown. In a balloon, it's exactly the opposite. In a balloon, you have no control. You have no power because you have no engine. You just go with the wind, carried in the direction and the speed of the wind toward the unknown. Which means that in a balloon, you are obliged to learn exactly the other mindset than the one we have in life. We have to understand that the unknown is our only certainty. So now you can tell me, why is it interesting to fly in a balloon and be pushed toward the unknown by the wind? Well, it's clear that as long as you stay at the same level, it is not interesting. Because very often, in your balloon, you aim for a direction. And if the winds don't blow into that direction, you won't reach that direction either. But what do you learn as a balloonist? You learn that the atmosphere is made out of several different layers of wind, which all have another speed and another direction. So if you want to navigate in the atmosphere, you've got to change your altitude in order to find a better wind that goes in the direction you look for. Maybe now you understand why I love to make speeches about ballooning. I believe that in life, it's exactly what we should learn. Because we have visions, we have targets, we have goals, we have objectives. But how often can we reach them? So often we have all these winds of life that are obstacles, turbulence, problems that prevent us from reaching our goals. And then we fight horizontally on the same level instead of changing altitude. Because we can change altitude in the winds of life. 
That means psychologically, philosophically, technically, spiritually, of course, also, in order to reach other levels, other influences, other visions of the world, other solutions, strategies, answers, that will necessarily reorient our trajectory in a better way. The problem is that, until now, it's a nice metaphor, and it's completely useless. How do we change altitude in the winds of life? How do we change our vision of the world? Well, we have to understand how a balloon works. If this balloon wants to fly higher, the pilot needs to drop ballast. Sand, water, all the equipment you don't need anymore, and then the balloon becomes lighter and can climb. This is what we should learn to do in life if we want to implement some more pioneering spirit, some more innovation, some more creativity. We have to identify our ballast first. And what is our ballast? Certainties, safety, habits, convictions, exclamation marks, paradigms, common assumptions, dogmas. Well, the list can be very long. And all these things are exactly the things we want to hold in our hand very strongly when something changes in our environment, or when we get in trouble, or when we lose control. If we want to be real pioneers, if we want to use the metaphor of ballooning in our daily life and professional life, we need to take our ballast and be ready to throw it to the ball. Which means, very practically speaking, we should identify what we believe the most, what is our real conviction, our vision of the world, and be ready to envisage exactly the opposite. I don't say that the opposite will always be better. What I say is that if we manage to think into one direction very strongly, and at the same time we manage to think the opposite direction, we don't have any more one line going in one direction. No, we have all the different lines in every direction, in three dimensions. And we have a lot and a lot of different solutions and different lines. We can do this politically. Why should we belong to just one political party? We can very well have some political ideas and at the same time use other ideas from other political parties in order to have a wider political understanding. Why should we have just one religion? We can very well have a religion and at the same time integrate beliefs from other religions in order to widen our, our spiritual beliefs and understanding. We can do it for finance. We can do it for education of children. That means teaching children how to think, but not what to think. Of course, we can do it for technology, and this is what it's been about the entire morning. We have ways to do, but obviously there are other ways we can integrate into a wider range of tools. If we do this, our future is not going to be anymore this single direction in a single line. It's going to be this huge, cloud of different directions going in every possible trajectory. And what will be pioneering spirit? What will be adventure? What will be crisis management, creativity, innovation? Because all these words mean exactly the same. It means that we are able to move up and down this vertical axis, changing altitude in order to try other behaviors, other strategies, other ways to do, other ways to react, other ways to think, until we find the altitude where the line goes in the direction we wish. Of course, it's not always easy to do it. We need advisors, we need family members, friends, colleagues, sometimes psychiatrists and psychotherapists. For balloons, we need weathermen. The weathermen are the ones who calculate in the atmosphere the direction of the winds at every point for every altitude. And you have, as a balloonist, a three-dimensional map of the future. And by moving up and down, you choose the way you get to your, to your objective. But it's very often paradoxical. It's not so much what we believe. When I was flying around the world with Brian Jones in 1999, there's a moment where we received a message from the weatherman who said, remain at 8,000 meters altitude with 60 kilometers an hour. Well, 60 kilometers an hour, if you want to travel 45,000 kilometers, you don't need 
computer to see that it doesn't work. With the results of gas we would have had, it was impossible to make it from the world. So we disobeyed. And we started to move up and down. And finally, at 9,000 meters, we found a jet stream that was 120 kilometers an hour. And I cannot tell you how much relieved and proud we were. So I picked up the sat phone, called the weatherman, and I said, hey, guys, don't you think we're good pilots up there? We fly twice the speed you calculated. And the answer was brutal. They told me, we've never asked you to fly so fast. And before I could say anything, they told me, open your gas valve, lose a thousand meters, and slow down. And then I started to argue. I said, I'm not going to do that, you know. We are not here to make holidays on every country where we fly. <laughs> We're in a hurry. We need to fly fast, otherwise we won't have enough gas. And they told me, you understood nothing out there or what? I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you have a low-pressure system on your left side. And it's all a strategy that's based on it. Do you remember that? And I said, yes, of course. I'm not stupid. And they said, yes, but if you move too fast, you will pass by that low-pressure system. You will arrive in front of it. And in half a day, you won't go east at double the speed like you wanted. You will move counterclockwise around it, and you will end up at the North Pole. <laughs> and then they asked me the question that changed my life. They asked me, hey, you're a good pilot up there. What do you really want? You want to go very fast in the wrong direction or slowly in the good direction? <laughs> and here you understand why it's important to have weathermen in a team, but not just for ballooning. Everywhere. These people with a long-term vision that can shake a little bit the head of the people who have these short-term visions. So often in our life, we want the success, the result, the satisfaction, the profit immediately. And we don't understand the price that we have to pay on the long run for such a short-term and unsustainable behavior. So why don't we have more long-term visions? Why are we so much focused on the small advantages we have now and sometimes we just drown because of the consequence of what we do today? Well, probably because long-term vision leaves a lot of space for fears and doubts. And people hate that. People are so much afraid of fears. And I tell you, when we were crossing the Pacific, we had to deal with fears. We had to deal with these moments of rupture that make the real ingredient of adventure. Because it's clear that we went back down to 8,000 meters. We slowed down. But when we arrived at the beginning of the Pacific, we had spent already 11 days in the air. And we had made only one third of our flights around the world. And we thought, if we don't manage to find a jet stream, we'll just ditch in 10 meter waves and wait for a ship to rescue us maybe during a week, because we're thousands of kilometers from every coast. And it's true that on the 12,000 kilometers of water of the Pacific, we started to be shitty scared. <laughs> but this is the moment when the adventure really started. <coughs> <laughs> That's the moment where the adventure really started. When we were overflying India, Africa, China, we could land any time and go back home. That was a nice holiday trip. On the Pacific, it was the rupture. It was the moment where finally we could not do as usual. As usual, we have the autopilot switched on. We think always more of the same. We reproduce as well as we can what we have already learned. And here, suddenly, all our strategy pre-established did not work at all. It was completely irrelevant. And fear is the moment where we understand that we are out of our comfort zone. And out of the comfort zone is the moment of creativity. As long as you're inside your comfort zone, you create nothing new. You just reproduce what we've learned. So these moments of fear are the moments where we get more consciousness, more performance, more efficiency. Of course, as long as we don't panic, but this is the, the trick for it between panic and adventure, sometimes the gap is small. But when you accept this fear, when you accept the, to be obliged to produce new solutions, to produce new behaviors, then you can drop as ballast the previous strategies, change altitude, and change direction. It is physically what we've done. 
and it's also psychologically worth your job. And after 20 days, 45,000 kilometers in the air, we've, we succeeded in the first ever balloon flight non-stop around the world, and landed in Egypt. But if I show you this picture, it's not to show you our smile, it's to show you how much gas was left in the last two fuel tanks. You see on this one, it's quite clear, on the other one, not so much. We took off with 3.7 tons of liquid propane. We landed with 40 kilos. <laughs> what does it mean? It just means it was the last moment to land. It means our flight was not sustainable. And when we speak about dependency to fossil energy in our daily life, we have it in mind as a theory. Here, I tell you, it was in our guts. We knew it was a question of minutes that we had to land. And it was just the right time for that. On that day, I made a promise to myself. I made the promise that the next time I would fly around the world, I would be independent from fossil energy. I would do it with no fuel at all. And I think it matches quite well with the spirit of adventure that we're going through these days. Because when the capsule of my balloon was brought to the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, together with the capsule of Apollo 11, Spirit of St. Louis of Charles Lindbergh, the X-1 of Chuck Yeager, the Wright Brothers Flyer, I was thinking, that's the end of the 20th century. It was a gorgeous century for exploration, to conquer the planet, even landing on the moon. That was the time where we had enough energy, enough fossil energy to do all that. How can this story of pioneering continue, but independent from fossil energy? How can we place it on another paradigm? And I think when we see all these big stories of the 20th century, we understand that none of them were new ideas. <coughs> flying, climbing the Everest, going on the moon, even flying around the world in a balloon, were dreams humankind had for thousands or hundreds of years. Why did it happen? It happens partially because of technology, but not only, because the guys who went on the Everest didn't use so much technology. No. They understood that pioneering spirit is not about new ideas, but much more about throwing away a lot of common assumptions, a lot of habits, a lot of certainties. Identify what we think, here again, and try the opposite. And if I show you the picture with a muscular powered airplane, it's to give you an illustration of it. When I was a child, a very high level scientist explained to me why it would always be impossible to fly on muscular power. He compared the muscles of the human arm to the muscle of the bird and said the diameter is not big enough to carry a human body in the air. Well, the problem for him is that the guy who crossed the British Channel with a muscular powered airplane used his legs and not his arms. <laughs> and the diameter of the legs is big enough to carry a human body. It shows that each time we're absolutely certain of something, we need to change the angle of view. This is exactly what we have to do when we deal now with the new pioneering feats for 20th century, uh, 21st century, excuse me. It's not anymore about going back to the moon, this has been done. No, it's about inventing new technologies, inventing new medications, fighting poverty, human rights, sustainability, new type of energies, and so on, and so on. And this matches so well with the challenges for aviation. And when I had this dream of having a solar-powered airplane flying around the world with no fuel at all, this is, I believe, one of the things we must achieve now to show that we can be much more independent from fossil energy, that the technologies we have today open a complete new era in terms of sustainability. If an airplane can fly day and night, even around the world, with no fuel at all, just on solar power, Nobody can claim afterward that it's impossible to do exactly the same for cars, for boats, for airplanes, for heating systems, for air cons, for computers, for servers. Everything is possible as long as we change our altitude and we drop some ballast. So you can say, what's new? Well, the idea of having a solar-powered airplane is, of course, not new. I told you what I think about ideas. No, they were already since 
30 meters solar powered airplanes. They were flying, though, in the, middle of the in the middle of the day with full sunshine. They had no storage capability. And each time the night came or there was a cloud, they had to land. So we speak today about the necessity to be in the cloud. And here, it's exactly the opposite. As soon as you have a cloud, you crash. <laughs> so these airplanes, as they were beautiful things for the time. But they showed the limits of renewable energies much more than the potential. So if we want to show the potential, we have to fly day and night. It has been done with a small model, four meter wingspan. One of our advisors, Alan Kopuni, did it in the US. Kinetic company did even two weeks in a row, but with remote controlled models, small planes with no pilot on board. Just a demonstration of technology. But I don't think it's enough. If you want to demonstrate really the potential of renewable energies, if you want to go on with pioneering spirit, you need to put a pilot on board. You need to have the people identify to these pilots who can speak to the schools, to the universities, to politicians, to media. And this can be a real buzz. The problem is that if you go from this remote control airplane to an airplane that can carry a pilot with no fuel day and night, it's not 4 meter wingspan anymore. It is 64 meter wingspan. And this is what we got as a data from the feasibility study that was made for me at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in 2003. It must have the size of an Airbus 340 or a Jumbo 747, but the weight of a car, 1,600 kilos, <coughs> carrying one fourth, one quarter of its weight with batteries, and the use of energy allowed is the one of a little motorcycle, little scooter. Those are the three parameters we had to reach. So the first three years of the project was about studying how it would be possible. People selected in different fields in order to try to make the impossible possible. And when we had the design, when we had the calculation, when we had the concept of that plane, we needed to build it. And we went to airplane constructors, and we went to glider constructors, and they all told us, it's impossible. Never you can make an airplane that is so big and so light. So what did we do? We went to a ship constructor, the guy who made the hulls for Alinghi for the America's Cup. And this guy had no idea it was impossible, so he did it. <laughs> <coughs> He produced all the big pieces of that airplane. Here you see the fuselage that is 50 kilos. All the plane is made out of oil, carbon fiber. We have nothing against oil. We just have something against the stupidity of burning it because it's a limited resource and the price can only go up and the price of oil going up will destroy the economy of our world. So we've got that plane. This is a year and a half ago. You see the skeleton, then we have the ribs glued on it, the solar panel glued on it. And in uh, June the last year, we had the first presentation of the airplane to the media and to our partners. And at this moment, we lost a few skeptical people. The ones who, during four years, were thinking, oh, these guys, they are really dumb. They are building a plane that will never exist. And suddenly, it existed. But it had not proved anything. We still had to fly. So when we made the first test flight this year, we lost some skeptic people again, because they said, well, they're flying. But of course, they will never make it through the night. Because it's clear that these first flights were just for aerodynamical testing. There was not yet the solar co collectors switched on and the batteries loaded. So we had to prove that the perpetual flight was feasible. And when my partner, André Borchberg, climbed into the plane on the 7th of July this year, it was all the credibility of our project that was at stake. We were telling since years in speeches, like this one today, in political meetings, in energy forums, in interviews, that with renewable energies, you can achieve incredible things. You can even get rid of oil. But we haven't proven anything. We have no example to give. 
If this flight would be a success, we would finally have an example to show. And for the entire day, the plane behaved very well, climbed to a maximum altitude of 27,000 feet, batteries at the same time being loaded by the sun and the engines running from the solar power. And when we arrived at the maximum altitude, batteries were full, and we had just one goal, just one. Reach the next sunrise before the batteries would be empty. And if you think of it, that's exactly the symbol of what we have to achieve in our world. In this airplane, if the structure is too heavy, if the technology is not optimized, if the pilot wastes his energy by flying in an unstable way, we won't have enough energy to make it through the, next, the, through the night to the next day, and the plane will crash. In our world, in our society, if we don't manage to have enough pioneering spirit for technology, for energy issues, maybe also for political visions, we will never make it to the next generation before a major disaster. So this airplane who flies through the night, day and night, in a perpetual way, is just a, a symbol, like a state of mind we'd like to share. And when the sun came back on the next morning, the plane was still airborne, we had still six hours of electricity in the batteries, and we could upgrade the goal. It was not anymore just flying through the night, no. We saw that we could stay airborne and get the rising sun, load the batteries again, to show that we could stay for the second day, we could make the second night, we could theoretically make the third, the third day, the third night, and remain perpetually in the air. So when we had proven this, the airplane could land, and I promise you, it was an incredible moment for all of us, because finally we could speak about, about our goal with something we had done, and not just with something we wanted to do. It's exhausting to make speeches of what we want to do, and people laugh nicely because they're polite, and say, speak as much as you want, it won't work. Suddenly you demonstrate that it works. And for the team, I tell you, this is also the moment when the energy, the joy, the satisfaction, the pleasure, the elation is big enough to go through the next problems, through the next disappointments, through the next frustrations. Because going in a project like this is not easy. And you have maybe two or three moments of elation like this for a complete year where you have to find solutions to impossible problems. So you see that this airplane, it's a, a little bit like on this, on this painting here. I love this painting from the painter Magritte. You see a pipe, and it's written, this is not a pipe. Well, this is not an airplane, or at least not only an airplane. It's a demonstration of a state of mind. It's a demonstration of pioneering, innovation, creativity. And especially, it's a demonstration of how to get rid of common assumptions how to identify what all the world believes and try to do the other way around. And I think in terms of climate change, there was this word pronounced, we had the logo of COP15 uh, this morning. This is exactly why it has been such a, a failure. You had all the heads of state speaking of the problem of climate change and the cost to solve it. How can you motivate people if you speak of problems and costs? No, maybe because I'm a medical doctor, I know problems are called symptoms, and the symptoms come because of, it, of an etiology, an origin, and every origin of a symptom has a medication or a treatment. In the case of climate change, it's clear that the problem is not the CO2. The problem is the cause of the CO2, which is our dependency to fossil energy. And this has more and more every day new technologies to solve that problem. These technologies or this clean tech are profitable. Google knows it. They want to power their servers more and more with solar power or wind energy. But there are so little people who understand that. Nevertheless, the technologies exist and they are profitable. And they will make the new markets. They will make the new jobs. They will make the new profit for tomorrow. So suddenly, instead of problems and costs, you have solutions and profit. I think it's much more motivating. And this is exactly what, what we want to show with this airplane, through all the speeches we gave, Andre and myself, like today, here with you, 
through interviews, political meetings, and so on. Our goal is just to have more people coming in the team, not as engineers or technicians, no, but psychologically. More people who understand that they can do the same in their daily life than what we make in our airplane. And here we need also to create much more communication and distribution of the information to as many people as possible. We have a huge media coverage, but up to now, I have to say, it's quite conventional media coverage, well, with internet also. I believe that I'm also going to push for Google solutions <coughs> for our project in order to reach much more people through the web, in order really to get more people involved in pioneering spirit and try to see that their daily life, each time they wake up in the morning, has the same challenge that what we do with our airplane to fly around the world. To say it short, the challenge is to go through the eyes to find the light. This is the last picture we've done around the world with Brian Jones. It's one of the windows of our capsule. It's frozen by the moisture of the night. And on the other side, you have a rising sun. You see that on the other side of the ice, you have the light. On the other side of fear, you have trust. On the other side of problems, you have solutions. But much more than that. On the other side of the fear of the unknown, of our wish to control everything, to fight all the changes in our life, we have adventure, pioneering, innovation, creativity. The problem for the world probably is that a lot of people have learned that it is safer to suffer in the ice they know rather, rather than to take the risk of crossing the ice to see what there is on the other side. So when you see these people who have as only goal in their life not to move, because they know what they have and they don't know what they will get later, so they want to hold themselves to what they have today. You have to help them. They are poor people. They are dangerous for society. They are dangerous for themselves. Clearly, the greatest adventure of life is not to land on the moon or go around the world in an airplane. No, the greatest adventure of life is to go through the ice, through the problems every day, through all these moments in our daily life where we lose control. Basically, where we have the choice between being old-fashioned in what we know or being pioneers for new fields, new domains, and new explorations. <coughs> so you see that it's something that is probably much more linked to emotion than to intellect. Intellectually, people can demonstrate the opposite of what I told you. Emotionally, they cannot. That's why I'd like to just finish this short speech with a film that we've done about the construction and the flight of solar impulse through the night. You will see on this film what we have done, but probably to make it useful, you should use it as a mirror and not so much as a screen. A mirror of what you are doing, of your pioneering spirit, of your wish to explore and innovate, Maybe also your wish to throw some ballast to the board and take new directions. So like this, I believe you can not just understand what I mean, but, but maybe experience it also a bit. Excellent journey in the winds of life and the winds of the future. Thank you.